background or um... yeah, leave it on how did you do that with your beard with my beard i don't know it's just it's just like magic <laughs> <laughs> what do you think or I, or I could be super villain do you want me to be super villain i'll be super villain yeah <laughs> Oh, that's cool. There we are, go back that's to normal. really cool. Right, all I've got is an old-fashioned lamp. I just... Oh, I, <laughs> you win! <laughs> you win. I better switch... It's in the it's in the DNA. Yeah, I better switch off my virtual background. That's terribly boring. Here I am. Okay, uh, right, but... that's good. Carla, when did you want to start? Did you want to give it a couple of minutes to let people come on in? Yes. What That's I'm well. going to do now, I'm sharing the code of conduct in our chat. So people can take some time to have a look. And also we are recording this session. So if anybody has a problem, please uh, let me know. Yeah. So we can see the room is filling up nicely. So this yes. is Carla, my colleague from Container Solutions. She will be monitoring everything in the background. Uh, the, the Dark Lord of the Sith, that's Simon Wardley, for those of you who don't know him. Uh, and I'm Jamie Dobson from Container Solutions. Welcome everybody. Um, I think we're just going to give it another 30 seconds, let people filter in. Um, there are some people registered from the United States, but I think it must be the very, very early morning. So oh, she must be yeah. early there. Yeah. Well, maybe, yeah. We, since we're recording it, we're going to share everything with them. So when okay. they wake up, they, they'll have everything. Yeah. And I can see Simon has now changed his background to that of the, uh, an, uh, uh, the office of an intellectual. So very good <laughs> uh, to that. <background. laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is actually my room. <laughs> yeah. um, a, qu a quick note on the code of conduct. So even though it's 2020, uh, we still need to fight for equal rights and opportunities within uh, the tech space and within society. Uh, and this is why we publish code of conducts. And this is why we insist on sensible and nice and inclusive behavior. So you can click that uh, if you like. But just to know that this is a big part of our work at Container Solutions, trying to be the change we want to see. Uh, and so hence the code of conduct there. And if you've got any questions regarding this stuff, of course, uh, stick it in the Zoom chat. Simon, should we get cracking? Should we get cracking, Carla? Yeah, I think we, we got a nice bunch here. So yeah, go ahead. Right, let, uh, me, let me share my screen. Uh, oh, you've disabled my screen sharing. Oh, wait, wait, sorry. I see uh, Ian and Willem say good morning. Morning, Ian. Georgie, hello. Chris, hi. Tim, hello. Hi, hi, hi. Morning, Jamie. Hello, Willem. All right. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. Oh, it should be good now, Jamie. Sorry. Right, that's okay. Let's have a look. And I think there's a few people joining. Yes, Let's more people. Share screen. Patterns and maps. That's definitely what we're talking about today. So another quick note for the people who just joined, the code of conduct is in our chat. Feel free to ask any questions. You can ask the question in the chat as well if you don't want to, to unmute yourself. And, uh, and yes, now we are, we are ready to start. So I'll leave the stage to, to Jamie. Thanks, uh, thanks, Carla. Okay, so just if you could just confirm, you see my presentation in full screen mode now. Great. We do, yes. All right, so uh, the last time we met a few weeks ago, we discussed a more general framework for strategy, strategy formulation and strategic execution. We also spoke a little bit about uh, decision making uh, and how do you make decisions in, uh, in a world that's full of details and that's, that's ever moving. We spoke about tools that could assist you with that, the cards that we use, but of course, uh, Simon's so we were delighted that Simon agreed to come uh, and talk about this, which will, will be the main topic for today. Before we get to that, let me do a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of introductions, let me get the scene, uh, and then I'll hand you over to Simon, who, who was, for those of you who know him, uh, is, is a wonderfully uh, entertaining speaker, very, very uh, huge figure, huge figure in the world of cloud and cloud native. Um, and so, of course, I'm, I'm as eager to see his talk as, as the rest of you are. Um, okay, a couple of things. We did speak about the, uh, the patterns for cloud native transformations. They are free. You can click them on the link down there if you need them. You can get an excerpt to the book. Most of the good stuff is for free. You don't need to buy it. Uh, and Carla will put the link in the Zoom chat now. 
We are going to be speaking about GitOps uh, in the finance sector in a couple of weeks. So I wanted to let you uh, uh, register here. Again, we're going to share the um, uh, link in the chat box. This is from Steve, who is the platform lead at Metal and the other uh, founder of Container Solutions, Pinny. GitOps is a very interesting, I would say it's a social technology. It's a process underpinned by tooling, but it lets you bring your cloud native strategy to life. We're also hiring, I swear to God, this is the last advert for today. We're hiring. The, the COVID crisis has been, and it's, it's, you know, it's fucked off. It's one has gone. We now have some really good job openings. This is for a client development lead. The role of this person will be to do stuff like this, come into webinars, help people understand what cloud native is, do a bit of teaching, bit of whiteboarding, a little bit of selling. So check that out and you know, share if you've got any friends who might be interested. Okay, so for those of you who um, um, don't know us, let's do a little bit uh, of an introduction. So my name's Jamie Dobson. I'm the CEO of Container Solutions. And we are a professional service firm that specialises in cloud native, but that starts with strategy. Now I started to learn about strategy back when I, I founded the business. I tried to learn a new thing every year. And about four years ago, I started reading about strategy. I went down that rabbit hole and I've yet to come out of it. Um, I ended up writing a book, which is, focuses heavily on strategy, strategy formulation and execution. And it's become a little bit of an obsession of mine. Uh, and it's good because when I write blogs about this, I get about three, three hits. And if somebody writes a blog about the top five things not to do in Kubernetes, it gets 3000 hits. So I'm a lone warrior, well, along with Simon, of course. Uh, and so my interest is, is in goal setting, objective setting, uh, and I'm here today uh, uh, to facilitate this chat. Simon, you want to say a few words? Hello. Um, my name is Simon Wardley. I, 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 I research for the uh, Leading Edge Forum. I, um, I, got, I used to be CEO of a software company. I built several companies, uh, sold them all to large US giants and Japanese giants. Um, and I, I got involved in the issue of strategy about 15 years ago and basically discovered that I knew nothing about the subject, despite the fact that I was CEO of a company. I was making it all up as I went along. And so uh, part of that journey led me to the whole area of mapping, uh, which, you know, I, I, I thought I'd take us through. Jamie, do you, do you want me to share some slides and do a sort of, um, I can do a general introduction. Two so, minutes, uh, two minutes, Simon. Two minutes. Sure, minute, no props. Two minutes. What I would also like to do is I would like to ask everybody on the call to drop into the, uh, the chat. Uh, if you want to say hello, if you want to say good morning, if you've got specific problems you're working on, let us know. And after Simon's talk, we might be able to bring that into the frequently asked questions or the, the Q&A part of the webinar. And if we can help you, we will. Two minutes, Simon, nearly there. So drop, drop, drop a few notes in the Zoom chat. Um, actually, do you know what, Simon? I am going to hand over to you because I think there's been enough preamble and everybody on this call has probably seen our framework before. So I don't want to bore them with that. So I think on that note, I am I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to give the screen to you. Ah. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, so one of the things, hey, so one of the things is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should have a little reaction button where you can like clap or, or thumbs up. Can you give a thumbs up if you've done lots of mapping beforehand? Okay, so judging by the reaction, either we can't find the button or more likely most of you are relatively new to mapping. That's okay. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to share a screen. Da, 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 da. Hang on a second. Uh, share screen. Let's go for this. There we are, and I'll put this into full screen mode. Can you see that? It just says the word strategy uh, with who I am, my email address. Is that all good? Right, super duper. So what I'm going to do is take you through a whole bunch of slides to describe the uh, issue and problem of strategy, and then uh, we'll get into a more of a general discussion. Good with you, Jamie? Perfect. Right, so we're going to start off with some basics, and then I'm going to talk about the issue of anticipation, how you anticipate change. After which we'll get into doctrine, which is about how you organize structure yourself. And then finally we can get into the strategy because that's really at the end uh, of, the, uh, of the process, okay? So basics. 
This is where it all starts. Uh, this is what I call the strategy cycle. Uh, it's very simple. It's a combination of two things. Um, Sun Tzu's five factors and John Boyd's OODA loop. Uh, and also the two types of Y, so three, uh, inaccurately named. So we start off with the game, uh, your purpose. The next thing we need to do is observe the landscape and how it's changing. So that's the landscape and the climatic patterns which are changing that landscape. Then we need to orientate ourselves around the space, and then we need to decide where we're going to attack, how we're going to manipulate that space to our favour, and then we act. And it's a cycle. And the more you go around the cycle, the better you get at the game. Doesn't matter whether they're playing chess or playing competition between companies. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay. So Sun Tzu's five factors: landscape, climate, doctrine, uh, leadership, purpose. You know, those are the five factors, and they just fit in quite nicely with John Boyd's Udo loop. So this I um, I read about. Oh gosh, about fifteen years ago. Um, well, a similar version uh, to this. I've refined it a little bit over time. Um, because I was running a company, I didn't know what I was doing. I was making it up as I, I went along. I, was, I like to call us, myself the fake CEO. And um, I, I realized you know, that I needed some sort of framework to describe the process of how we make decisions and choices, how we do strategic games. And one of the key parts of this is the, the, the first bit, landscape. So, um, in my company at the time, we had lots of what I would call systems maps, business process maps, my maps, loads of maps, left, right, and center. And this is one very, very simple map. Right? It happened to be of one of our 16 lines of business online uh, uh, photo service. We had, we, we had about 10 million users in total across all our services. And it's very simple. You've got customer and a number of different components uh, to provide basically image manipulation, printing, and photo storage. Well, one of the things about this map, when I looked at this map, if I take a box like CRM and I move it, so basically we move it over here, um, does the map change? And the answer is no. But I looked at a geographical map and I thought, well, you know, if I take a geographical map of the world and I shift Australia and I moved it, say, next to London, does that change the map? And the answer is yes. So, so why doesn't it change it here? And what I realized is that everything I had in business, which was called a map, was in fact not a map. They're all graphs. Now, just to explain the difference, um, the three graphs at the top are identical. Nottingham, London, Dover, Nottingham, London, Dover, Nottingham, London, Dover. The three maps at the bottom are completely different. And the difference between a graph and a map is very simple. Uh, in a map, space has meaning. Now, pretty much, well, in fact, everything we have in business, which we call a map, has one thing in common. It's not a map. They're all graphs. And if you can't, if you don't have a map, you've got, you've got no real way of understanding the landscape you're competing in. And um, so it's difficult to learn about your space. So, so that's what I sort of discovered back in 2005. I sort of assumed that everybody else in the world knew how to map. It was just me um, because I hadn't done an MBA. Uh, and, and so I published this stuff and started to use it. And it took me another six years to discover that other people weren't mapping as well. So part of my journey, I got really into military history. Um, so this is uh, Themistocles, uh, uh, ancient politician, Greek general, on the Battle of Thermopylae. So very, very simple. Persians were invading. Um, what he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium uh, using the Navy. Uh, and then uh, the army, uh, this would force the Persians along a coastal road to a narrow pass called Thermopylae, uh, where the Greek army and their independent city-states could then defend against the Persians. Now, there are about 170,000 Persians, and there are only 4,000 Greeks um, in this, uh, the, the, this army, which was sent to defend, which is why they needed them to go into Thermopylae. It's a narrow pass. And in that 4,000 Greeks, there are about 300 Spartans. And so that's where we get the story of the 300. Now, with a map, we can discuss, you know, where components should move, how we should play the game. But I, I looked at this in terms of business. And in terms of my business, you know, we had lots of, well, we didn't have any maps. Uh, what we did was things like lots of SWOT diagrams. So I, I thought about this and thought, well, what if I was Themistocles? Imagine you're members of the Athenian city-state, you're part of the Greek army, it's the eve of battle, you're standing there, uh, you know, war's about, you know, we're gonna, I'm giving you a purpose, you know, 
Persians are invading, 170,000, got to defend against them. Uh, but then I say to you, I don't have a map, I don't have a, understand the landscape, but I don't understand the environment. Uh, but I have no fear, for I have created a SWAT diagram. So strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, motivations, the E-Force might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians to turn, uh, turning up. Uh, opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans, we're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans. And the threats, the Persians get rid of us, and the Oracle says uh, a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. Well, the simple question to ask is, what would you use to communicate and determine strategy and battle? Position and movement described by a map or a magic framework like a SWAT. Well, it's obvious, you position and movement. But my business in 2005 was all magic frameworks. It's all SWAT diagrams, it's all stories, it's all that sort of nonsense. And so I set about saying, okay, I need to somehow create a map of business. Everything I've got which calls itself a map isn't a map, it's a graph. And I need somehow to have a map of business. But obviously, this is what they learn at MBAs and they didn't have the money. So what are the key characteristics of the map? Well, it turns out three basic characteristics. Whenever you look at a map, it has an anchor. So a point of reference like magnetic north. Uh, you have the position of pieces uh, like Athens is north, south, east or west of this. And then you have movement. So consistency of movement. So if I'm going north, I'm going north. Uh, so if I want to go from Thebes to Thermopylae, uh, it's northwest. And, and northwest is a particular direction. So what you've got is anchor position movement. And so I thought, right, I need to recreate that in a competitive environment. So what I did was started with a tea shop, because I like tea. And very simply, um, I, need, I need an anchor. So I started off with the users. So I just picked two users, uh, in this case, the business and the public, as in business selling tea and public consuming tea. Often you'll have many anchors, like the regulators, government, I mean, it could be anybody you choose. So business has a need to sell cups of tea and the public have a need to, we hope, consume cups of tea. But cup of tea has needs. It needs cup, it needs tea, it needs hot water, and hot water needs water, it needs a kettle, and kettle needs power. So what you can do is create a chain of needs. Now with this chain of needs, the things like power are a very, very long distance away from the consumer. If you're, you're buying a cup of tea, uh, you're, you're concerned about the cup of tea. Is it hot? Is it nice tea? What does the cup look like? Uh, you're not really concerned about the power that was used to heat the kettle to make the cup of tea. So this is distance in terms of visibility. It's, it's, it's far away. So now what we've got is anchor and position described through a chain of needs. But the other thing is all of these components are evolving doesn't matter what it is it all starts over in the left hand side the genesis of novel and new items then you get custom built examples and products and rental services and commodity utility services so this is a pattern of evolution which i described back in 2005 um, and it took 9223 publications uh, to actually develop that axis a very painful moment not that it scarred me forever um, so the point is now i've got anchor position and movement and i can show this map to others and they can challenge it. So one of the most powerful things about maps is that normally in business we have stories. And if you challenge a story, you're challenging the person because they're the storyteller. And we tell everybody, you know, that your story wasn't successful because you weren't a good enough storyteller. You need to be a better for storyteller. So we make that entire thing political. The beauty about maps is I put my story, if I have one, into a mapping form. You can tell me the map is wrong without challenging me. So somebody can look at the map and go, you're missing stuff. And somebody could say stuff from robots. Okay, somebody could say kettles should be, you know, more standard kettles. We shouldn't be custom building. Somebody say, oh, we have to custom build because of brand exclusivity. Maybe uh, our custom built kettles give us some sort of magic. I don't know. And then, of course, people can start adding financial figures to this. So you can start looking at the flow of capital between components and use this to measure, you know, things like uh, what are the technical debt, what is the cost of using custom custom kettles. Now the beauty about this is it doesn't matter whether you're from sales or whether you're from finance or operations or business or, or, or what, what you're from, marketing. We can all talk about the same environment using a common language. Pretty simple. Okay, so just to show you a quick example of where this is useful, this is a uh, insurance company. Uh, this is their process flow for getting compute into their, into their data centers. Compute, order server, server goes into goods in, modify mount racket. 
Um, they had a bottleneck about modifications and mounting servers. Uh, they want to improve the bottleneck, get rid of the bottleneck, improve the process flow. They'd spent six months working on this and came up with a plan to basically invest a load of money in robotics. All very digital, all very exciting. Now, if you turn up and say, why are you doing robotics? You'd immediately have a fight because uh, you're challenging their story. So I simply said, map it. So this is a 15 minute conversation and they go, user needs compute, they put compute and product, I would argue, say it's more of a utility. They go order server, server goods in, they go rack, mount, modify. Now the point is they put their assumptions down on paper and so I can now challenge their assumptions without challenging them. So I said, why have you got rack and custom built? And they went, well, we have a company that makes our racks. Ah, so what are the modifications you're making to servers? Well, they don't fit our racks. So we have to take cases off them, drill new holes, add new plates, in order to get them to fit our racks. And that's why you need robotics, yes. And of course, at this point, the penny's dropping, because a far better way of solving this problem is not robotics, is to use standard racks. Now, how does anybody get into this position of using custom built racks? It's because we're all trapped by history and trapped by stories. Until you can see the context, it's very difficult to challenge it. Because once you can, you say, we should be using standard racks. In which case, and this is a very, very common problem. It's probably the most common problem I see, and billions are wasted in this. Uh, far too much of our industry, our industry is focused on proving process flow and making um, basically ineffective processes more efficient. Where in fact, what we need to first concentrate on is evolutionary flow, as in taking things custom built, turning them into a commodity. Now, if you can't see the space, you can't do any of that stuff. All right, so once you do that, you realize, well, compute, that should be a utility. That's the process flow you really want to do. Should I invest a bucket load of money in robotics? No. And I mean, this was many, many tens of millions. And this was a 15 minute conversation. And it's not because people are daft. It's simply people are trapped by context. All right. Once you do those basics, then you get into anticipation. So when you look at the strategy cycle, there's three different types of patterns that appear. Climactic patterns, doctrine, and gameplay under the leadership category. So climactic patterns are the rules that influence the game. And these are very useful for anticipation. There's 30 of them that we know of, and that's far too many to go through. So I'm just gonna mention a few. If I take a value, uh, one of the maps, so a chain of needs mapped over evolution, and so this is one of my lines of business, that, 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 that so-called systems diagram, this is actually that mapped. What we, we know is that everything evolves. If there's supply and demand competition, everything that's on the left ends up on the right. The next thing you learn is we have inertia to change because of past success, that's the second part. So if you look at something like Blockbuster Netflix, Blockbuster, first with um, you know, website, video ordering online, video streaming experiments, also first to go bankrupt, why? Because it was successful. Uh, past successful business models create inertia to change. Uh, the next pattern you learn is that as things uh, evolve, they enable higher order systems to appear. Um, so this is componentization effects, electricity enabling radio, television, whatever. And we also discover that those new things, top left hand side, are new sources of value. So you, you, they're very uncertain, but you know, electricity enabling like TV, that's an entire new industry. Now the point about this is by simply applying those patterns, to any map, you can start to see where you might wish to attack. Do we want to build the first? So back in 2005, this was our choices. Do we want to build the first computer to utility, run time as a utility, wait for somebody else to do that game? I didn't realize it was going to be Amazon the next year. I thought it was going to be Google. Uh, build something on top, create some sort of new risky value, or do we want to differentiate with our existing business? So we can now have that sort of proper discussion about the space and where to invest. So another simple, similar theme. If you take application, best coding practice, runtime operating system, best architectural practice to compute, you can map not only um, things and activities, but practices. Compute goes to a utility, cloud, this is uh, 2006. That will enable a new emerging practice. Now this is a pattern known as co-evolution and that creates new needs. So we knew this in Ubuntu. So I, I ran strategy for Ubuntu. This was 2008, 2010, well, for a company called Canonical that provides Ubuntu. So 2008, we simply mapped it out. We used the map to work out where to attack the space. 
We knew there'd be a new emerging practice, didn't know it was going to be called DevOps, but we knew it would appear there. And we used that to attack, and I spent half a million, took us 18 months, we were like 3% of the operating system against Red Hat and Windows. Uh, within 18 months, we were 70% of all cloud. If anybody was in the cloud space, you may remember those days, it was all Windows, Red Hat, Windows, Red Hat. Within 18 months, it was all Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Um, you, you were mapped. All right. Um, so there are other patterns that come into play. So for example, I mentioned we have inertia, and that's often by previous, you know, best architectural practice for the previous way of doing things, or past success. And of course, when we actually jump over these boundaries, uh, we actually, uh, so we, we move from compute to utility, from computers to product, to computers to utility, we see capital flow. And uh, that's a process known as creative destruction. And so all of this stuff can be discussed with a map. Now, these changes are not new. Um, the industrialization of any technology shifting from product to utility has been going on for a long time. And uh, all of these create ages, some of them big, some of them minor. The big ones are things like the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, age of steam and transport. All of them kick off with industrialization of some component, some technology. I know people talk about industrial revolution 4.0, and that's just because they can't count. We've had a lot more ages than that. Now there's another side to this. In order to make this jump, so we shift from product to utility of any component and cause an explosion of new practices, and new things, you need a number of factors in place, concept, suitability, technology, attitude. Now, uh, sometimes that happens slowly. Sometimes you have a forcing function, which makes that change happen more rapidly. So New York City, turn the, uh, oh gosh, 20th century. So this is 1902 or thereabouts. Uh, this is a picture, pretty grainy, of New York City. You can see on the left-hand side of the road, well, on both sides of the road, there's mounds of, well, it's horse poop. Uh, the city was being buried in horse poop. There were just too many horses. And, and this acted as the forcing function for change, which is why within the space of about 18, well, 18 years, I mean, this, the entire New York City radically changed through the use of the motor car. And of course, once the motor car becomes established, new practices, new things built on top, we never go back. We never went back to horse-driven carriages. And one of the most exciting things about this change, um, so we shift, say something shifts from, say, compute as a product, a computer's a utility, it doesn't matter what it is, anything from product to utility, we get these new emerging practices, and these new emerging practices, these new things, create new forms of organization. So agricultural revolution, we got the commercial farmer's market, industrial revolution, American system of engineering, age of steam and transport, we got the joint stock company, etc. All right. So this sort of stuff is going on today. And you can most clearly see it with events like this. So, so what's happened is events are going virtual. So users. Want to go to an event? An event needed a physical space. We've been able to do virtual events for ages. In fact, the first one I did was 2006 or 2007. Uh, but we haven't done them. Why not? Well, we've had lots of inertia because of pre-existing events companies and physical spaces, etc. But we've known for quite some time that when we make the bound, that jump from sort of... Uh, uh, physical space as product, as in renting rooms, to much more virtual. We would get new emerging practices, new ways of doing things. But, but nonetheless, we, we had resistance. And that resistance mainly came from social interaction. Everybody saying, oh, we can't do events in there. It's not the same as doing it in a physical world. Well, we've had our forcing function, COVID, physical isolation. Now, I mean physical isolation, not social is isolation. There's new ways of doing these social interactions online. So this is now creating another interesting problem. You've got a lot of businesses who depended upon events in a physical space, and many of them are sort of hoping that after uh, the pandemic, whenever this stops, we'll be able to go back to the status quo. In fact, there's many businesses out there sort of making the assumption. There's slightly... I would say more canny businesses who are realizing actually social interactions are going to be recreated in this virtual world. Events are going to be how are being recreated in this virtual world. And in fact, that's going to lead to new emerging practices and new needs, new ways of doing things. And we're seeing this across multiple different industries, things like telehealth. Uh, so suddenly we're doing physio 
therapy remotely with sensors, all sorts of things are changing. So the reality is, yeah, we're unlikely to ever go back to how it was. A bit like New York, you know, once they got rid of the mountains of poop, did they go back to horses? No, they stay with the motor car. So that brings me into doctrine. So very quickly, purpose, once you start to understand your landscape and you learn climactic patterns, you start to anticipate change, you come against doctrine. And these are universally applicable principles, regardless of context. So no, they're not rules of the game. These are things you could decide to do or not to do. Uh, they just happen to be universally useful. So I'll give you a quick example of one. Things evolve, become more efficient. That enables higher order systems to appear, which have new sources of value and worth, which then evolve. When this happens, as things evolve, their characteristics change. So on the left-hand side, they're sort of chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, doesn't matter, money, penicillin, computing, whatever it is. Over the time, it becomes more industrialized, ordered, standard, stable, dull, boring. Now, because of this, there's no such thing as one size fits all methodology. So if you're building stuff on the left, extreme programming, Kent Beck's original type working with uh, XP, you're because you're all about reducing the cost of change because change is the norm. If you're dealing with stuff on the right hand side, you're all about reducing deviation. So Six Sigma outsourcing to a utility provider, that's pretty good stuff. If you're dealing with stuff in the middle, you're all about lean, so Scrum, MVP, all those sorts of things, because you, you're about learning and reducing waste. My point about this is there's no magic one size fits all method. Now, Unfortunately, if you go to any conferences these days, and I, I do it all the time, I have done it for over a decade, I go to an Agile conference and tell everybody Agile doesn't work everywhere, it's like burn him heretic. I do the same at the Six Sigma, they like burn him heretic, lean, burn him heretic. Well, the reality is none of them fit everywhere. You have to use all of them, depending upon the context. So I'll give you an example, high-speed rail, HS2. Um, James Findlay, this is the one bit of the entire project which you know makes me smile. And it was building the entire railway in a virtual world. So um, this is James Finley's systems diagram for that. Uh, the problem with this diagram is, um, you know, which bits should I outsource? Which bits should I build in-house? Which bits should I, you know, build and buy? How do I answer that question? There's about 370 million possible permutations of that question with that simple diagram. So what he did uh, in afternoon, sat down, he mapped it. This is 2011, sent the map to me, looks like that, and then now it's easy. Stuff on the right hand side, you use outsource, stuff in the middle, lean, stuff on the left, off the shelf, uh, you use agile in-house um, techniques. So that's what they did. And this project ended up being built ahead of schedule, uh, under budget, ended up in the public accounts committee being praised, which is like fantastic. Now vendors normally hate this because vendors want you to outsource the whole lot. Uh, preferably with a big specification document because it's guaranteed extra money because the stuff on the right hand side you can do that with because you can define it but the stuff on the left hand side um, you can't define so you'll always incur excessive change control costs it's pretty much a scam um, but um, you know very simple to break it by simply mapping it apply correct components Unfortunately, what happens in most organization is somebody, you know, gets it all wrong and says next time we need to specify it better. You know, if, if you have one of these people, get rid of them. Um, the problem is not specification. So doctrine. The first thing of doctrine you learn is to focus on user needs. Number one. The second one you learn is to understand the details, understand the components. Third one is to think small, break it into small components. Next one is to use appropriate methods. You know, Agile here, Lean here, Six Sigma. And the last one there is challenge assumptions. Okay, well, I say last. You're going to ask, where does doctrine come from? Well, it's pretty simple. As I said, as technology evolves, particularly industrializes from product to utility, you get this co-evolution of practice. And we saw this in 2011. So I was able to actually monitor this. I did a population study. And you could see the change of practices in companies. Literally, the DNA of companies changing. So very much traditional, department-based, corporate focus was profit, open source cost reduction, learning was from analysts, they were changing into service cell-based, 
you know, open source seen as a weapon, uh, not just using big data, but driven by it, using chaos engines rather than disaster recovery. Literally the principles of the, um, of the company were changing. This is 2011 and that's just extended. Well, those observed characteristics I put into a ta table I call doctrine, and that's roughly the list of doctrine that exists today. So there's 30 common climactic patterns most people aren't aware. There's about 40 um, basic patterns of doctrine. So I'll just mention phase one because you ignore the rest. Use a common language. Challenge assumptions. Understand what is being considered. Fo know your users. Focus on user needs. Remove bias. I mean, these are so basic, okay? But most companies are dreadful at them. If I sit there with a few web engineering giants, they're pretty good across the whole lot. A couple of weaknesses. This is your typical bank, financial services company. Rubbish. Don't even know who their users are, nor their user needs. Don't remove bias and duplication. But does it matter? No. Because it's okay to be hopeless, as long as all your competitors are hopeless. If everybody sucks, no one gains an advantage. It's really simple. Uh, the danger is when one of those new players move into your space. Okay, so now let's get to strategy. So one of the beauties about maps is we can look at the map, we can look at how it's changing, we can look at the capabilities of us and opponents, we can use this to discuss a space between multiple groups of people, determine potential scenarios and options, and then we take a gamble on one or another. So with a map, you take a map of your business, and you can apply common economic patterns, so you can anticipate where things are changing, which gives you an idea of where to invest, where you can attack. Now, if you're at this stage, you already know that you're doing the phase one doctrine. Your capability is not too bad. Yeah, I don't know about the underlying stuff. You may be pretty useless at the phase two, phase three, phase four, but at least you're good at the phase ones. I, you have to know your users, your user needs. You have to use, you know, be thinking about, you know, knowing the details, understand what is being considered. But you'd be good at that sort of stuff. That's better than most. Then what you learn is you can manipulate the space to your favor. Now there's about a hundred, well, over a hundred, economic, uh, sorry, uh, context specific game, forms of gameplay, ways of manipulating the space. We don't have time to go through this. Um, but you know, simple things, like you can use open as an accelerator, you can slow, accelerator to evolution, you can slow things down with fear and uncertainty and doubt, you can use constraints. There are many, many ways of manipulating the space to your favor, okay? And of course, the more you do it, it's like any other game. The more you do this, the better you get at playing the game, as long as you do uh, pre-mortem, post-mortem. So that's basically a process of, let's map it out. Let's, let's think about how, anticipate how it's going to change. Um, let's think about how we want to affect this. Then let's go and act. And then afterwards, let's come back and look at the map and what actually happened. And that's the process of learning. All right. Now at this point, somebody normally says to me, what about organisation? What about culture? Again. Far too complex, okay? I'll just pick on one culture. So this is Kroeber. Uh, despite a century of effort, anthropologists have still uh, not managed to come up with a, um, a, an agreement on what culture is. Okay, lots of people talk culture. Anthropologists who specialize in the space have spent 100 years and still can't agree what culture is. Now, part of the problem is this. Uh, language is a discipline of cultural behavior. I mean, language is part of culture. And so if we uh, look at something like Gödel, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, for those who are not math mathematicians, if language is part of the model of culture, you won't be able to use language uh, to effectively describe it. So, so that's a problem. Now, when I map uh, at the bottom, the axis, I talk about different stages of evolution, genesis, custom, product, commodity. But you may have noticed I also talked about practices, emerging practices. Um, so those stage one, two, three, four of evolution, I, these are just labels. I could talk about practice, novel, emerging, good and best. I took, could talk about data. I could talk about knowledge. All of them evolve. In fact, I can pick any of these labels and mix them together. Concept, emerging, convergent, accepted. Now I use that when mapping out things like ethical values. So fairness, re reciprocity, very much accepted in abolition of slavery. But uh, things like workers' rights, civil rights in the US are built on that. And of course, that leads to anti-discrimination laws, paid holiday, concepts like universal basic income. So one of the beauties is you can map ethical values within a system. Now normally, 
uh, we don't show it in a mapping form, I show it as a pipeline like this with a square box, just basically saying that there are new values or new beliefs appearing and over time they evolve and become accepted. And if you start with that basis, what you then can do is map out culture. So, so this is a map of culture. Uh, it has many different components in it. And why show you this? It's very simple. Um, people often say to me, oh, what should our culture be? Well, the problem is it's not singular. You belong to many different types of collectives, your family, your organization, uh, your nation state, etc. And then people say, well, can we copy their culture? Well, you can't just copy people's values. Um, you can't just go, oh, what are the values of Spotify? Let's copy those, we'll suddenly be Spotify. Because there's all these other components involved as well, including things like memory, uh, doctrine and principles used. Uh, you can adapt, uh, you can adopt, sorry, I should say. Um, so you can adopt doctrine into your organization. So those are those principles. Of course, it's going to impact you slightly in different ways compared to others, depending upon the landscape. So focusing on user needs, if I'm a military, military organization, my users are very different. If I'm a retail organization, you've discovered there are feedback loops. That creates all sorts of complexity uh, within the system. So uh, idea of sense of belonging to a collective is dependent upon things like behavior, which impacts safety and psychological safety. You also find there are constraints. So when it comes to gameplay, I said there's about a hundred different forms of manipulating markets. Some of those you can't use depending upon the values of your organization. So manipulation is difficult to use in an organization which talks about honesty and trust. So we start with the basics. I map your landscape. I talked about anticipation, climactic patterns, how you can use that to understand change. Um, one of those patterns leads to what we call co-evolution of practice. And so as things industrialize, new practices appear. And those practices, um, are some of them are very important. They, these are the principles of doctrine, as we call them. And there's about 40 of them. And they're a good way of indicating the capability of a company and how it can adapt. And then finally, we got on to strategy, which is the bit about understanding your landscape, anticipating change, looking at where you can attack, looking at your capabilities and those of your opponent. And then eventually you learn patterns of how to manipulate that to your favor. Right, so the last thing I'm gonna tell you is all maps are imperfect representations of a space. This is a map of France. It's not a perfect map of France, it's still a useful map of France. In order to create a perfect map of France, it would have to be one-to-one -one scale, which means it would be the size of France. It would therefore be France. Um, all maps uh, are not the territory, they are just representations of a space. Doesn't mean that's not useful for learning. The second thing I'm gonna say is forget culture, strategy and organization, which is great for a talk, which is all about strategy. Forget it, okay? These things are complex subjects which people love to dive in. Ah, oh, we wanna change our culture. We need a bit of a reorg uh, and all that sort of stuff. Great things to say, forget. Focus on situational awareness and your principles doctrine first. List of 40, start with the phase ones, you know. Do we challenge assumptions? Are we focusing on users? Uh, we focus on user needs. The, the, the bottom stuff is all about stopping companies from punching themselves all the time. That's the first strategy you should have. Stop punching yourself. And, and once you do that, then you can start worrying about, you know, once you get good at that, worrying about these far more complex and far more difficult subjects, where, which, you know, most, most people have a very weak understanding of. And that's it. That's my quick tour through, through mapping. Um, you'll find this all medium.com Wardley Maps. There's about 600 pages of book there. There's a list.wardleymaps.com. This entire community is, you provide tools and everything else. It's all Creative Commons, help yourself. I've been doing it for 15 years. It's spread. We have map camps, which, you know, last time we had about 800 people turn up from all over the world. Um, it's pretty simple. Just, just remember anchor position of movement, start mapping it out, share it with others, let them challenge you. and like any other thing you'll, you'll learn from there. At that point, I'll stop sharing. How was that? So this is where we unmute and we do a round of applause. Oh, you don't have to do a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Did that make sense? Thank you very much. Does that make sense? Questions, please, in the chat box. It made a lot of sense to me, Simon. Good. I, was, I was very interested as to how you started to explore military strategy because I'm not a military person, but I've okay. recently become very interested in it because I see the parallels between my day job at CS 
and and the campaigns of the Duke of Wellington, for example. <laughs> So, so, so the bizarre thing was, is, you know, there I was, CEO of this company, uh, this is 2004, 2005, we had, we had all these wonderful strategy sort of vision statements, they're just random words, you know, just memes copied from others, in fact, I've nicked our vision statement from another company, it was like, you know, we're open source and agile, I just changed a few words, because uh, I hadn't got a clue what I was doing. And um, I actually went to a, uh, I, I was getting desperate. I was reading every book there was on strategy, getting nowhere. Uh, and I was worried everybody was gonna rumble, I was making it up, but our revenue was going, growing, profitable, that sort of thing. Uh, so I went to, a, I was in a bookstore and I, I asked the bookstore, uh, what, what do you think? And she said to me, um, you should buy um, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. And she, uh, she persuaded me to buy two copies, uh, very canny. Um, and, and, and there's good reason because they there were different translations um, because the original Chinese each is the translation. So it was in reading the second one uh, that I noticed these uh, five factors. Um, uh, you know, the uh, purpose, understand your landscape, climactic patterns, doctrine, and then leadership. And it was that point I started going, well, how do we understand our landscape? And that took me into the field of situational awareness. And that took me down the path of military history, because how do we learn in, you know, in the world of military, it's through maps and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, that's where I started. And uh, I started getting into military maps and Battle of Thermopylae and Themistocles and all this sort of stuff. And then uh, eventually uh, I, I started to realize yeah, that was the bit I was missing. I didn't have a map because everything I had was not maps, it was graphs. Um, even though we call them maps, you know, we keep using that word, it doesn't mean uh, what we think it means in the, in the words of the Prince's Bride. So it was like uh, my map, systems maps, uh, business process map, none of them are maps, they're all graphs. And so that led me on that journey. Sorry, yeah. The question's coming in now, uh, Simon. So Tim, let me, let me start with you. You were asking, what do people usually overlook in this bucket of methods? Oh gosh. Um, so the first thing that people do is they try and create the perfect map. That's the, that's the, the biggest mistake um, uh, because you can spend far too long. I mean, if I'm doing a nation state competition, I, I, I'll do a map in a few hours. Um, so what you have to realize is that the most important thing to do is get your assumptions down on paper as quickly as you can in a mapping format and share it with others. Because it's, it's not the map that is actually critical. It's the process of mapping, including allowing others to challenge the assumptions. Because others will come and say, look, you're missing this component, you're missing this component. That's more industrial, more of a commodity, that, that isn't. So, so the, the biggest mistake is, is spending too long, trying to create a perfect map. Do you think the sort of dogmatic idea that we should have a bias for action stops us thinking? Because oh. we, we do a lot of thinking at CS. We, we do exactly what you say. Go off site, have a few, few beers, map stuff out, mess around with whiteboards, and we have we come up with good plans. And I think a lot of the people we, we deal with jump straight to actions and they just go off on wild goose chases. Okay, so one of the, uh, the um, principles or doctrine that you, uh, in, in that table that you'll see is the bias for action. Um, I, it's a desire to do things, but a desire to do things does not mean I shouldn't think at all. I mean, it's, uh, uh, there, there's always a bit of balancing act uh, in most of these doctrines uh, between, between the opposite. So um, a bias for action, the opposite is a bias for inaction. Well, you don't want a bias for doing not nothing thinking. generally. You don't want a Let's have a bias for not thinking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a bias for stupidity. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you, you have to be careful with words like stupidity and things like this, because a lot of what I see when you're in a map, yeah, I, I mean, I've seen this so many times. I mean, um, I, I had one particular um, uh, very large company in the US. Uh, this was in uh, 2010, to roughly. Uh, they showed me their plan for a, a private cloud, and uh, uh, it was basically about 1.2 billion pound, uh, 1.2 billion dollar plan. And I was able to sit, quickly map it out. And I said, "Look, I can build you the same effect for about 20 million." And they were like, "How can you do that? It's really simple. You pay me 20 million." I'll sit on a beach for five years drinking margaritas. Then I'll phone you up and say we failed. And that way you'll have saved all the rest of the money. And uh, they didn't like the idea. And they went and spent the, uh, you know, I, I actually got phoned up about seven years after this uh, and by one of the execs saying, we'd wish we'd paid you the 20 million. 
But nonetheless, because they spent huge amounts, disaster effort, um, it was obvious from the outset that it was going to fail. I mean, I see this with contracts. Uh, the reason why I mentioned the uh, uh, HS2 example, if you simply map out a space, you can overlay the contracts. You can often see the contract's going to fail well before it started. So um, uh, it's not, people don't do this stuff because they're daft. Uh, it's just because they're unaware that you can, or they are trapped by past context, uh, custom building racks, or they're trapped by stories. Stories yeah. are very dangerous things. So where, um, yeah. so where I come in, where I come from in Yorkshire, when you don't, when you're trapped by context and you're unaware, we call that being stupid. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't say because yeah. these people aren't daft. No, it's very, it's, yeah. it's very easy. It's like the insurance company, you know, they had a wonderful story. They'd spent six months, you know, intelligent people working on this problem, coming up with this idea of robotics. It's only when you draw it out, the context, you just go, why are we using custom built racks? That doesn't make sense. Yeah, maybe that's one of the biggest takeaways. We're all attracted by context. And of course, as an external person, you see the other person's context, but you don't see your own, which of course makes me think, what stupid things are we doing right now? within our business or within our, our projects. Yeah, everybody is. Um, and and part, of the, part of the problem, this is why when I go back to that doctrine in phase one, one of the biggest ones is challenging assumptions. Mm. So one of the beauties about maps is you put your assumptions down and if you've, you've put your assumptions down on a map, you've got a map of space, I can say to you, I think this is wrong. And I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm telling you the map is wrong. And so we can actually have a discussion. We can allow people to challenge assumptions. And if you give it to me in story form and I tell you it's wrong, I'm telling you you're wrong because you're the storyteller. And immediately it becomes highly political and all the rest of it. And that's one of the most common problems. I Simon, I'm going to try to pull us back to the questions now. Yep. I yeah. think people uh, love this stuff, but you, we've got some very specific questions and I'd hate people to sure. go away with them. One of them from uh, Chris. Hello, Chris. If the x-axis of the Wardley map is to do with evolution, could you please tell us a bit more about the y-axis? There is no y-axis. Uh, what, what there is a chain of needs. So um, what you have, uh, if I just share this, uh, da, 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 if I just go back to um, sharing the presentation. Here we are, just for a second. So uh, da, da, let's go back a few slides. Uh, culture map, sorry, apologies for this, gonna quickly zoom through. Right, so what you've got is a chain of needs, starting from the anchor at the top, the customer, what do they need? And then you can have many customers, customer uh, users, customer, business, regulators, whatever. You've got a chain of needs and uh, the components are evolving. Now, some when people begin, uh, on the left-hand side, the y-axis, I, I sometimes write value chain, visible, invisible. That's just to help people to get used to the idea that you're talking about a chain. It's pure scaffolding, it doesn't really exist. It's, you can throw it away. And these days I tend to say, well, people understand this enough because in the early days people were like, oh, what's the axis on the white house? So I had to give them something to get them started. Now I just throw it away because it's, it's, uh, uh, it's actually meaningless. So, um, so your anchor at the top is, for example, the, the site of the battle in the early ge geographical map, but underneath that it, are the things that, lower, things that are low level down. So compute, the power grid are down at the bottom and the value adding services are right up at the top closer to the anchor. Is so let me, yeah, let me show you something. I'm going to just switch to a whiteboard because it's just easier to show it to you on a whiteboard. Right. Can you see a whiteboard? We see it, yeah. Yes. Okay, so let me just, uh, oh God, I'm useless with that uh, whiteboard. That was a good idea then. Um, right, <laughs> go on. Let's draw a line here. There we are. Yeah, nice red, excellent. Uh, we'll go Genesis. Custom product commodity. Right. Let's go put a user here. They want a cup of tea. Let's go. My cup of tea needs many things, including hot water. That needs many things like cold water. That also includes, let's say, we're not custom building kettles. Kettle. Okay, and that requires power. Okay, so to the point of view of the user, power is a long, long way 
away oops uh, from them now what we can do is we'll create a new need over here for environment so concern status or whatever and then what we can do is we can link that to power so though power sorry is far away in this chain it's much closer in this chain does that make sense so you can it's a bit like the intel inside so this is why you know there is no access really over here um, because it's within the chain so it's possible to take things which are very low in the chain and make them more visible through the use of status some other need or whatever it is that's one of the ways you can manipulate a space so uh, in the example i said intel intel inside you know who cared about the cpu well we spent a bucket load of money on marketing to say it's got intel inside so suddenly you create importance for the cpu i mean it's quite far removed from you know if i'm word processing do i really care what the cpu is no um i didn't at the time but i can make it more important through marketing make sense Right, Simon, let's move forward. There's a lot of questions. I'm, I'm not sure no. all of them, so I'll try my best to uh, be selective. And yeah, there is one that got a plus one. Uh, who got the plus? Read the plus one out, Carla. Let's go for that one. It's like any tips of getting people on board to a mapping process. The open architecture of this is not comfortable for many. Okay, so the, the quickest tip is, is try and grab people who've got military backgrounds. Uh, the reason why you grab people in military backgrounds is you can talk to them about situational awareness and they will get it. Um, your biggest problem is going to be most execs in organizations are storytellers and it's potential that maps uh, undermine their power base because it tends to democratize the process of strategy and allow people to challenge. Everybody says we want challenge unless you give it to them. Uh, because generally execs, when they say we like challenge, what they actually mean is we want to challenge you, not the other way around. So, yes, you're going to have fights. Um, the best way is use it within small groups. Try and spread it from there. Try and get uh, if you can find a few people with military background. Uh, it's pretty easy to bring those as allies. Right. Okay. Now, we have a very specific question. Yeah. Somebody is leading a change in a bank and he's got a group of um, scrum masters. Okay. How can they use mapping to create a strategy and move it forward? All right. Well, first of all, um, don't do a strategy. Don't do organization. Don't do culture. I, I would ask, uh, the first question I would ask is how do we make decisions? How do we understand our landscape and how things are changing? If you don't have a satisfactory answer to that, say, well, look, we're going to spend a few hours trying to map out this space. Uh, we'll pick one problem. We'll map it out. If we find it useful, we'll continue it elsewhere. If we don't find it useful in helping in discussions, where we just won't bother. Uh, and uh, that's what I would start with. Start, okay, with the decisions. Okay, very good. Now, comment from Adrian. Uh, I love that the big takeaway from the strategy webinar is forget strategy. Yeah, start with situational awareness and, and think about principles. Yep. Yeah, very good. Now, are there any more questions or would anybody like to unmute themselves and say anything? I mean, you don't have to use the chat if you wanted to ask a question in person, that's also fine. Well, that's almost perfect then, because that means the hour is up and we've had a lot of different questions. Um, I'm, I'm happy to keep going for a little bit longer. Depends on you. I'm the button that's set. We don't, we don't mind going. Usually people who come into these things have got an hour booked out because they've got to go back to work. So I think oh, they have, to, they have to go back to work. We can continue, you know, you know we, can, yeah. we can continue right. chatting so, if you wish. So what I think is interesting, Simon, about strategy is... Yeah. I'd be curious to get your take on this. So I think about artists and art historians. And art mm -hmm. historians are, are, of course, not always artists. And I think I, we were quite good at strategy, at, at container solutions, before we knew what strategy was. So we right. had a feel for the uncertainty, a common sort of feel for, well, this thing we can outsource. We didn't, we didn't map it, but yeah. we also knew that what we were doing at, at least five years ago was yeah. a secret source. So we yeah. still do that. And do you think there's a lot of strategists on this call who are hidden, who, who, who have don't quite realise that they're, they're a strategist in the making? So, so one of the things about mapping is that I, I, you know, I'd sit down with my friends in Netflix in 2010 and other places like this, and there were people like Adrian Cockroft, uh, who I taught to map, and people like that, who had mental models that were equivalent. So a lot of people have a mental model equivalent to what I use in mapping. It's just they've got no way of expressing it. 
And so it, it mostly mapping is a tool of communication challenge and things like that. It's pretty simple. I mean, these days, I mean, they, they teach it at Moscow Institute of Technology, Harvard, uh, Kennedy. I'm doing a, a day at LSE, did day at judges. And so it's spreading. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's spreading because people are finding it useful. But uh, a lot of people have um, uh, mental models uh, which, are, which are similar. Hmm. What about the psychology of strategy? How do you help people who... Because so, so, for example, you often see executives are very bullish, right? Because they, they hate uncertainty, so they want to go quickly and get an initiative going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. people are t so timid; they only want to make incremental changes. Yeah. How? What do we do about the psychologist of our psychology of our executives? Well, well f first of all, mapping should be a quick exercise. So we're talking, you know, a couple of hours. Uh, create a map and start that process of getting challenge and everything else. The biggest problem is often people don't like the challenge. Um, so you know. So, it, it, everybody says we want to challenge assumptions not necessarily true that people actually like uh, those cha assumptions being challenged um you don't want to spend too long um you do find it creates certain problems in terms of democratizing strategy so suddenly you find that uh, people with the best ideas in the room are not necessarily the executives and the best paid uh, and so so that can create all sorts of uh uh, interesting and uncomfortable moments, shall we say. We now have a related question from Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Uh, welcome. Yep. How do you avoid uh, mapping turning into design by committee? Uh, I found that this creates a lot of inertia in decision making. Well, mapping? Yes, apparently, yes. Wow. Um, gosh. Um, I, I've... Oh, sorry, I've so, never. Andrew, Andrew, <laughs> one second, Simon. Andrew is clarifying: design by committee creates inertia. How, oh. do, how does map? How do we make sure mapping doesn't evolve to design by committee? Oh gosh, um, well, that's an interesting one. Uh, so, UK government. Um, when I wrote the um, with Liam Maxwell and others, the Better for Less paper, which led to transformations like things uh, like the introduction of spend control and help with something called uh, uh, the formation of GDS. Um, the purpose of maps was to introduce challenge, and and so challenge. We that was in a unit called spend control. Now, maps should be a relatively quick process of just taking somebody and saying, right map out your assumptions, focus on the users, what the components, so somebody else can challenge it. Um, uh, how does that stop uh, design by committee? I mean, uh, you know, if somebody says, oh, we're going to map out the entire landscape and the entire environment before we make a decision, you, know, I'm, you just have to say, you know, don't, uh, because the landscape will change. I mean, one of the areas of doctrine is a bias towards action. Uh, and the fact that strategy is iterative. So, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it, it's no different from military campaigns. You could get somebody say, oh, we've got to create the perfect map of the landscape and everything else before we make any decisions. Um, doctrine is your only counter to it, to say, look, we can't spend a year uh, mapping out an entire space before we make a choice. Um, this is supposed to be a fast exercise. So how do you stop design by committee? Um, well, I'd map out, well, since I mapped out mapping, I, if, you, if you end up being a, a, having a design committee, I would map out the design committee and ask the question, right, what users is it your needs? Is it actually meeting? Is it doing that job? And I'd use mapping to under, undermine the entire committee itself. Yeah, very good, very good. That's all right. All right, any more, any more questions? Oh, I've got one. Go then, Simon. You ask a question. What do you think without beard? Do I look better? I'm loving this world, you know, because not only do you have all the virtual backgrounds and everything else, you can have a great deal of fun. Uh, I mean, um, I, 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 a lot of work that I'm doing is also looking into industrialization of um, techniques of radicalization, including things like deep fakes and all that sort of stuff. And, and the technology which is available is just amazing. I, I just love, you know, the ability to change appearances and to all this sort of stuff. It's just, it's, just, it's just great fun. I mean, you've got the normal sort of background of um, uh, Zoom and things like this. So, you know, we can all do the, uh, uh, you know, suddenly, I don't know, I'm in space, uh, that sort of thing. 
Uh, but 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 I do love the ability. You know, suddenly I'm the the Dark Lord in space. It, it's that sort of capability, which is just this just. Is uh, this is my favorite. The Dark is it? Lord. <laughs> it's got a lot of good feedback and a lot of thank yous for everybody. Positive, positive feedback. Let let me know how to wrap things up, Simon, because I realise that people's people. Yeah. Probably the time is precious and people want to get off. So yep. first of all, let me thank you, Simon. You've got a lot of people in the in the Slack comments saying thanks, great session, awesome. I've got a good sure. fantastic. Um, I would say if anybody has got any feedback to for me and Carla, how we can improve this, um, then we will take that, we will listen. Yeah. And forward, we're going to be doing a session about strategy every single month. I'll, I'll speak to Simon offline and see if I can convince him to come back. Oh, <laughs> and <I've> always. <laughs> what he's thinking. Um, <laughs> but unless there's any more things to no, share. That's good. We, we're going to share a feedback form in a follow-up email. And in the email, we're going to share the recording and, and the slides of the session. So everybody's going to get that. Yeah. You're getting more compliments here. Great stuff. Amazing session. This was great. That Jamie Dobson is an awesome guy. Oh, no, I made that one up. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie Dobson <laughs> is an awesome guy. There we are. <laughs> but from everybody at Container Solutions, thank you so much again to all of you who came in. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Before you disappear, I'm sorry, Jamie. Container yeah. Solutions. We know the runtime <laughs> is shifting from product to utility containers below that stack, all that Kubernetes stuff. I know everybody runs around, it's the future. It's not the future, Lambda, serverless. We're gonna co-evolve practices above the stack. When are you gonna change your name? When it stops working. <laughs> <laughs> if, you look, if you look at our research department, we're, we're all serverless. We're all about serverless and psychological. I know, I know, I know. So there you are. Yeah, that, that, that'll be our next session. When is that'll Jamie going to change the name? Yes, let's, <laughs> let's focus on mapping for containers and serverless. Let's do that, Simon. That's a great idea. Yes. All right, you're on. Right, brilliant. Okay, so thanks again for everybody. Watch out for the feedback form. We'll take criticism on Twitter or in private. Anything goes. Have a wonderful summer, and we'll be back talking about strategy in about six weeks from now. So thank you again, and thank you, Simon, for a fantastic session. Oh, it was great fun. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.